thank you for joining me today on this plant-based vegan summit. How are you? I am very good, thank you. Just um, uh, sort of happy and gutted at the same time. Why? Because it's that yesterday was that time of year, which every single year I sort of look forward to, which is good, but then at the same time it's bad because it's the longest day of the year, so you can do as much as possible in as much light, and then today it starts getting dark and starts going towards the winter time. Oh, well, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's good news for me because my chickens won't be going to bed at 11 o'clock every night, so... Oh. <laughs> How many chickens you got? Just 10. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. I've always wanted chickens, but I haven't got the I haven't got the right garden for chickens. No, they're amazing creatures. And if I don't turn up at three o'clock every day with mealworms. Anyway, so tell me a bit more about yourself and what what made you become vegan plant-based in the first place? Um, I uh, left school and I went to college to study catering to become a chef. Uh, I left college and um a bad experience, uh, not getting into it, but uh, it sort of put me off cooking. Then I became a window cleaner, skateboarder, professional skateboarder. Then I started working in the industry, uh, and then Dirty Sanchez happened, and that just took me on a whirlwind ride for quite a few years, over a decade, doing live shows, partying really hard. Um, then I started getting into fitness in 2000. 2010, 2011, because that party lifestyle sort of took its toll uh, and I wanted to do something about it. And then in 2015, I went vegan uh, because all the stuff that I was doing was um, ultra endurance. I started with a half marathon, full marathon. I'm never, I'm never happy just sticking with the norm if i do one marathon i need to do i want to do 10 and then I'm running the country and i did one iron man i want to do two three and then 10 and i've now i've just finished rowing the atlantic so it was just i have this addictive personality in it and i was doing a lot of research and reading on people uh who do ultra endurance events and do all these um triathlons and marathons and there was a lot a lot of vegans involved in this one before then i wasn't a vegan and like most non-vegans i was you know i'll admit i'd be that person who would take the piss uh it's only because i didn't really know anything about it i just you know she just it was that's just the way it was and i started researching into why a lot of these athletes were on vegan diets and why they were vegans and Whilst doing that, uh, uh, there was a few people saying that was watch a program called Cowspiracy. So I watched it on Netflix, and <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was like, "Oh my god!" I just, I just thought veganism was not eating dairy or animal products, but there was so much more to it. And educated myself it really did educate myself on what was going on and, and the harm that it was doing to the planet as well just just by eating just by eating meat and dairy uh and i think i was pescatarian up until then and as soon as i watched conspiracy i just went vegan straight away next day that was it boom flat out i'm not eating meat anymore i'm not eating dairy uh it sort of relit it relit my flame and fire for cooking because I've always loved cooking, but now I needed to replace that meat and dairy that I was so used to eating. And I used to eat a lot of meat. Uh, and so I went on YouTube. I started looking for recipe ideas. And, and it just stuck me there. A lot of the vegan um, channels on YouTube were quite boring. And I just thought, well, why don't I now make my own one? And just have a little bit of a laugh, but try and make you know, just just make it more fun, more interesting, and more appealing to that kind of audience that sort of has been following me for many years uh, through Dirty Sanchez. Uh, a lot of them who are not vegan, and trying to convert, trying to convert them at the same time. Uh, and it and it was you know a lot of people really enjoyed it. Uh, obviously, a lot of people took the piss like they do. I'm sure 
we all know what that feels like. Your friends taking the mickey, but you know, that's just your friends just having a laugh. But then you do get the ones that are really going in hard on you. Uh, and I said, Christ almighty, I never realized that becoming vegan and, 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 and the V word was so offensive. And anyway, I started doing it and I didn't stop me. I was nobody was going to stop me from doing it anyway. So I carried on doing it. And uh, BBC showed interest in what I was doing. And then Dirty Vegan started, I think it was the, yeah, it was the first vegan cooking show to hit the British TV screens. And uh, that's how my journey started, really. You have a book out as well. Well, two now. Um, yeah. What a great title for a book. And the front cover is amazing. It just stops you when you walk past the um, shops. But did you expect it to be so popular? Oh, no, I, no, no, I did not. Not at all. I mean, it was like Dirty Sanchez. Didn't expect that to become as popular as what it did. We did one series and I just thought that was that was it. And that, that went crazy. And I think the thing with Dirty Vegan, I mean, at the time, we signed for the Dirty Vegan show with the BBC. And at the same time, I was going to be doing the, uh, the become the first person to do the triathlon of Wales, so I was swimming from Penarth, 25 miles, uh, uh, a sea swim to Porth Call, jumping on a bike hugging the coast of Wales all the way up to the top and doing an angle seat and then running down off his dike back to Cardiff, finishing with the Cardiff Marathon. So I was training for that. And the, so the same production company was filming Dirty Vegan. So we were trying to film Dirty Vegan. This is the first time anyone had cooked, anyone from one tribe who did it, uh, had filmed a, t a cooking TV show. So we, we were all learning. So they were very, very long days, and I needed to get training in to do this triathlon as well. And then they said, well, we've got a book deal to accompany the show. So I was like, what? I can't do it. I haven't got that time to fart, let alone do all this. So I, I sort of used the recipes that I used on my YouTube channel for the first book. Uh, I've put them together, and you can't just... I mean, I cook with my eye, but obviously when you're doing a book, you need to use measurements because, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't cook. And we, we try to make the book as easy as possible because uh, for me, opening a cookbook is uh, if there's loads of recipe, lo loads of ingredients, big method, sort of try and find the easiest one. So we try to make it easier. And for all the people that are following me, they're not cooks anyway. So the book was made for those kind of people to make vegan cooking easy and uh we managed to get it all we managed to do the trial so i managed to get a tv show out they managed to get the book out in time and this was like oh, no no uh, september october time we managed to get it all out before christmas obviously the show went out in veganry and the book went yeah the book just went the book went bonkers so i didn't really didn't expect that and you've actually set an example to other people now and because of your background and your skateboarding and the lifestyle, you've actually got a, a different type of following. Now, one of the problems I have as a vegan is, like you say, people, people ridicule you. Um, but what we've found from interviewing people is that there are a lot of men now who are actually going vegan and a lot of athletes that are going vegan because they can see the benefits. What benefits did you actually see physically, mentally, um, performance-wise when you went vegan? When I first went vegan, uh, and I'll, I'll be honest, I've always, I've always said this, my, my swimming times, my cycle times, and my running times became faster. All of a sudden, I, uh, I can only put it down to the vegan diet. Uh, I did initially lose quite a lot of weight, I think, because I think my body was just getting used to a completely new diet. Uh, but when it, when it did get used to the diet, my my weight sort of stayed the same and it was all it was all good. But I've saw I've seen lots of benefits, but at the same time, veganism is becoming very popular now, which is great. But at the same time, there's a lot of 
processed foods. And everyone always thinks, but just because you're vegan, you're going to be skinny and you're going to lose a lot of weight, blah, 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 blah. But with this, with the processed stuff, you, uh, <laughs> you can put on a lot of weight. Don't get me wrong. I love the processed stuff. It's really good. But once in a blue moon, it's pretty, it's tasty stuff. I mean, Beyond Burgers, man. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> they are banging after a, after a long run or a long swim or, or a long bike ride. Remember coming home, having a drink and I'm going to be on Beyond Burger. <laughs> Absolutely banging. But um, yeah, I, I, I it just I just feel more healthier for a, a, having a vegan diet. I don't feel uh, I'm so, more, a little bit more regular on the toilet uh, and a bit That's more. That's a bit of plants. <laughs> a bit more, a bit more healthier as well, rather than yeah, you know what I'm saying. Mm. But uh, yeah, it's great. It's good for me. A lot of people I know who've gone vegan, they've all said the same thing as well. So it's all positive, no negatives at all. So yeah, I mean, a lot of people do go vegan, don't do the research, and just think eating chips and potatoes constantly is going to, and then they're going to go, oh, I'm ill. Well, of course you're ill. You're not. You're not eating the right foods. You've got to. Your body needs the, the, the vitamins, the minerals, needs variety. So, I've gone away from calling it vegan now because one, because of the ridiculing, but two, because like you just say, that, you know, those cauldron sausages, they taste amazing. So do the Beyond Burgers, but it's the plants that make us healthy. It's the plants that we need to eat. When I speak to people about eating plants, they they just shrug and they, they have no idea where to start. What would be your takeaway for actually getting people onto a plant-based diet? Where do they start? What would be, what, how would I get people onto a plant-based yeah, diet? Yeah, where do, would you tell them to start? Um, well, I know a lot of meat eaters, really good big meat eaters, they just go for, if they go for stuff like the Beyond Burgers and, and like you said, all the processed stuff that, that is really good. Just, I say go, go for that. I mean, the daily alternatives, they're amazing. It's not, you know, it's not hard. So I just tell them to go for stuff like that and slowly but surely wean them off the processed stuff and just tell them more about the more home, the whole food side of plant-based eating. Uh, I mean, there's a shop in Cardiff called The Spice of Life, and it's been there since the 80s. And my mother used to go there when we were kids, and they, you know, they've got the lentils, they've got the pulp, they, they, they've, got, they've got it all, the flax seeds, the, the chia seeds. It, it's an amazing shop. It's really well priced as well, not, not really expensive, like a lot of people say, all the dried fruits. And we sort of, and I love going in there. And so you sort of introduce people with that kind of stuff, and then try and introduce them with the the more healthy side of a, a vegan diet now one of the things veganism is good for generally is the environment animal welfare and human health so you've sort of covered the magic three really but you support a, a trust a sanctuary called the dean farm trust would you like to tell us a little bit more about that and how you got involved yeah i went um, they asked me to he asked me to come down and see if I wanted to spend some time helping out at the trust. I was like, yeah, cool, man. It's only down the road for me. It's not far. It's only about half an hour. So uh, I drove down, uh, met uh, Mary and Sam and all, everyone who works there are volunteers. And it's just it's a big farm uh, sanctuary with, they've got uh, turkeys, chickens, uh, sheep, cows, you, you name it. And it's just, they just, it, they dedicate their lives to looking after these animals. Some of them are uh, old dairy cows and rather than being slaughtered, they go there and they get looked after and they have a nice happy life until, well, just rather than being slaughtered, they're there and they have a happier life. And going there, helping out, just doing little bits and bobs, what we do, whether it be cleaning up the cow's plop or giving the turkeys a hug or whatever, but there's there's a turkey there, my favourite, called Harriet. She's ace. She's just this turkey, and she's just really calm, and she just likes having a she just likes having a head rubbed, and she sort of closes her eyes and goes into like a <laughs> goes into like a trance. But um, they're really they're doing really great work. 
I think they've got about 180 um, residents in there now. And uh, it's just a good place to go as well. I, I think if you can go on the website. So if anyone out there wants to sponsor them, help them feed an animal or sponsor an animal, then you can do it all on the website. Uh, so, and I mean, when I did the row, we were initially doing the row for human and mental health charity. And I, I just asked if we could um, add uh, Dean Farm Trust to it as well. So I've been down there once or twice, and I'm due to go down there soon again to see um, see what else they've been up to. You've just mentioned the row. I tried to get hold of you quite quite a few times. And I was told you was halfway through um, across the Atlantic. Um, obviously, you were doing it for a charitable cause. First of all, how did it go? What inspired you to do it? And which two charities did you support and why? How, how did it go? Absolutely amazing. I mean, it was more than what I expected. It was just so, so tough. It was... And I don't say that, yeah, I don't say that lightly. That, it, well, it was really, really tough. Really men mentally and physically demanding. Uh, but at the same time, just absolutely amazing. It was such a great life experience. Being, being out there 24-7, waking up, and watching the sunrise, watching the sunset, being surrounded by nature, uh, seeing the fish, the dolphins, the turtles, uh, experiencing different weather conditions, and, and just <laughs> just rowing. I mean, two weeks into it, it started to become quite painful, especially on the buttocks. My buttocks was in one hell of a mess. It looked like a looked like I sat on a pizza. Uh, and all my still, I'm still haven't recovered now. My hands, I can't even clench my hands into a fist anymore because all the joints have seized up from holding the oars for so long. But um, that's just a small price to, price to pay, really. And it was, you know, it was two hours on, two hours off. Uh, so we drove for two hours, and then we'd go into our cabin, and we'd have we'd we'd boil some water, stick it into our rehydrated or freeze dried food bag, seal it up let it rehydrate for about 15 minutes. Of course, my, all mine were vegan um, foods. And then we'd eat them. And by the time we've done self-care, looked after our wounds and our boils and our, everything, and our cuts and stuff, we would go to sleep for about an hour, get woken up again, and repeat. And we did that all day, every day for seven weeks. And um, we had one day where the weather was just, bonkers massive swells i remember saying to billy who was uh, who was our skipper he's done three oceans before and i said is this like is this like the the big waves is this is this the biggest and he said yeah this is big waves this is and i was like oh yes so we were like going up and we were coming down and, and it's just wall of water and i was just like oh my god and you're in the middle of nowhere so if anything goes wrong you it's pretty gnarly but um would I rather be on a boat doing that or be at home in lockdown? Well, the question is simple. I'd rather be on a boat living life and um, enjoying everything that was around us. And we did it for two amazing charities. Uh, Dean Farm Trust, which has just been talking about, and Human, which is a mental health charity. And I'm sure you'll agree that um, this COVID pandemic uh everyone's talking about the death rate and the hospital rate and stuff but what people aren't talking about is the mental health epidemic but this just going on all over the world from people being locked down people losing their jobs people losing family people not seeing family and loved ones and it's driving people um around the bend so doing raising money and awareness for uh, a charity like human who are looking after men's mental health it was really important i mean i was speaking to a fireman last night or uh, one of my mates he's a firefighter and i said how has it been for you during the lockdown and he said the mental health um the mental health aspect of it, it all has been absolutely crazy and the amount of uh suicides he's had to attend uh in work because of it has been 
he's, 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 he's actually said it's, it's been alarming. It's just not good at all. But yeah, sad times, man. So um, yeah, we, we we've been raising money for Team Farm and Human, and uh, yeah, that's that's some of the reasons why we were doing it. And we were also doing it obviously for ourselves, for the personal challenge to see if we could actually row across such a vast ocean it was 3,200 miles. So and we got from what well, was meant to start in Lanzarote. We had a little bit of trouble with the boat. And, uh, the Spanish SOS has to come and rescue us, but they didn't really rescue us. They sort of crashed into our boat and caused damage. But we took it to Fortaventura. We fixed it five days later. We left Fort Ventura for Antigua. And I think we were the first, yeah, we were the first people to row from Fort Ventura to Antigua. And seeing land for the first time after seven weeks was most probably one of the best things I've ever seen. Got off the boat. My sea legs were so bad, I just fell back into the boat. Uh, the celebrations were good. And um, yeah, happy days. That That's amazing. So, Absolutely amazing. Thank you. As with everything in life, we we have hurdles and we have barriers and the two words that we come up with is I can't. At what point or did it happen when you were rowing across the Atlantic? Did you think I can't, I just can't do it anymore? Oh, but there's no such thing as you can't. Uh, really, is we, we can. Do never say I can't because uh, I don't care who you are, you can. If you put your mind to it and you really want to do it, you can do it. Uh, and, and I can't to me is just a bullshit excuse to because you can't because you because you don't want to do it. Uh, I mean, that's cool. If you don't want to do it, just say you don't want to do it. Just don't say I can't. So uh, and when you get to something like the Atlantic, it's um, it's not one of those things. <laughs> it's not one of those things when you're about a thousand miles away from land. You say, I can't anymore. Because if you say you can't, not only are you letting your team down, you're letting yourself down. And you've just got no you've just got no choice but no you've just got no choice but just to sit and row. Row, sleep, eat, repeat. And it's the same with I it's the same with I am I am doing stuff like Iron Men and, and long distance triathlons. People people go, I can't. I think a lot of people say they can't because it hurts. I mean, it's only pain. Don't worry about it. I mean, you, you'll get to that point. A lot of us get to a point where we go, I can't go anymore. I think David Goggins said it. So that when, when, your, when your head says you can't go anymore, you've still got 80% in your, whatever it is. You can just keep, it's amazing how far you can push your body. And your body can take so much shit. It's unbelievable. So, um, yeah, my, my answer to that is you can. And even when you start doing that, I can, and then it becomes, oh, I can't go any further, you can again. Just keep, 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 keep going. I mean, I knew you know, when I did 10, when I did 10 IM in 10 days, and I mean, I was in absolute bits, but, and then there was a lot of times where I said to myself, oh, I don't think I can go any further. And you just keep telling yourself, you can, you can, and you just keep going. And then you cross the line and you can. <laughs> uh, and that's the great thing. No matter what challenge we, we come across in life, we can. Even though we think we can't, we can. And that brings me back to the mental health side of things. I'd just like to go back to that for a second. Traditionally, mental health is not something that's been recognised across the board. And particularly in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and right up to modern day, it's not something that men suffer from, which is why it's great that you've actually supported that charity and raised awareness of it. And if there's men out there listening to this talk and they're thinking, you know, I, I, I'm not feeling too good myself, what, what can you actually, source of motivation and inspiration, can you actually give them to, you know, help them on the way? Men have suffered, men and women, I've suffered with mental health since the day dot, but nobody's ever talked about it. Nobody's ever realised it. I mean, you can't tell me that all the men that went to World War I, World War II or whatever, came back and didn't have any mental health problems and PTSD. I, if you're going to go and see stuff like they saw, your, you know, your head's not going to be right. I mean, I know, I know my grandfather suffered with men, mental health, now looking back. 
and some of his behaviors and stuff and then that gets passed it, it, i mean modern day mental health there's just it's just there's just so much stress out there i'm not everyone suffers with it differently uh our lifestyle is non-stop these days from the moment you wake up the moment to go to bed you 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 you, you go 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 and i think a lot of there's, there's all kinds of mental health. I'm no doctor, so I can't. You know, they, I'm not one. I'm just, I'm just talking from my experience. If I'm before I went on that boat thingy, and I was locked down in my house. I mean, yes, I had a room machine in my house, and I was trading for my house for the room. But at the same time, I was drinking a lot. I was drinking, I was drinking heavily, and uh, it didn't put my head in, in a good place at all. So if you're going to drink, if you're going to drink heavily, if you're going to take drugs. If you're going to eat bad diet, uh, and if you're not going to train and go outside, then that's, they, that's there's four things there, which is a recipe for disaster. You you know, you, if possible, I'm not here to preach, but if possible, eat a whole food plant based diet, exercise daily, uh, don't drink, don't do drugs, uh, but again. Everything in moderation is not too bad, but it's just, I, I, I honestly think exercise is the biggest thing for mental health. If you can't do any of the others, at least do some exercise. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. The most easiest thing you can do is run it. Get your trainers on. Your doors, the door's just there. Open the door. Right, you don't have to go for a marathon or 10 miles. Go for a one-mile run. That person you were before you left that door to the person coming back in will be a completely different person. You'll have a smile on your face. Your endorphins are kicking off. You'll be happy. You'll be wanting to do stuff. And that will change your life. And, it, and just keep doing that every day. And I've always said, rather, when you go to the doctors, and, you know, I've been on um, sertraline before. Uh, I've been to counsellors. I've been to CBT. I've been to all kinds of the therapies and stuff like that to try and sort my this bonkers head of mine but um nothing works better than exercise and when i go to the doctor the i mean the quick answer the doctor says is here's a prescription for some tablets and why don't they write to your prescription for a free gym membership and say well you know, here's a free gym gym membership where's your where's your nearest one here's um here's a workout for your for your own personal fitness or whatever uh whatever state your body's in and go to the gym and make an effort and guarantee you won't need those tablets that that just exercise in itself will put a massive smile on your face and change your life it will get rid of your bad habits get, get rid of your weight and it will just change you as a person and if you've got barriers to exercise the first step is showing up Buy a new pair of running shoes, put them on on day one, go outside in them on day two, do a bit of walking on day three, do a jog on day four and just build it up. No one's expecting anybody to change overnight. And that's the same with the diet as well. Um, yeah. Like you said earlier, start with the processed food and then change to plants and learn how to cook um, and learn how to enjoy life as it should be and connect with nature. Um, nature is one of the best things that we can do for human health. So uh, if you can't run a walk, you know, with the trees, with the sky, with the birds chirping, um, just it just releases some form of freedom in, in you, as you obviously experienced in the middle of the sea. Um, what the, was the most amazing thing that you took from that experience? Uh, the most amazing thing I took from that experience was uh, being a part of my phone. <laughs> <laughs> we are, we're all I don't care what anyone says we're all glued to these things I mean I do a lot of my work on this it's social media whatever it may be my emails and everything but um, that's just the modern way of working but when I went on that row I, I, to me I, I don't do life very well I, it's just there's too much noise and I'm like ah my head goes out and as soon as I went on that boat and I left land, I just felt like this weight come off my shoulders. My phone was out of signal. Uh, I wasn't getting any emails. I wasn't social. I couldn't see social media. And then half, and I was, just, I could, 
I just felt so much. I just felt I could feel it. I was out at the sea and I just felt so much happier because I was I was in nature and I was basically I was what I was doing is I was living. Like obviously, my phone was on set to take video footage to send home for them to put on socials and stuff. But that's the only thing I was doing. And then they said your screen time. Now my screen time said, uh, but when I'm back home, my screen time says twelve to thirteen hours a day on my phone. Oh. Yeah, that's that that's bad. And when I was out to sea, uh, the thing came up and said your screen time is thirty minutes or thirty-seven minutes or what it was, and I just went. Put a massive smile on my face, and I showed the boys. I said, "Look, thirty-seven minutes," and I said, "The only reason that's thirty-seven minutes because I'm actually fucking out here living, doing stuff." Uh, sorry about the language, but and I, and that's for me. What that's why I loved it so much. It's put a massive smile on my face. I was away from that, just digital nightmare of just everything that we've got to do every day, and it made like I said before I left. I was drinking a lot as well. And I came, I left with a bad head and I came back with a more positive outlook on life. And ever since I've been back, I'm be far more happy. I'm a bit more, bit more jumpier, a bit more talkative. I'm hanging out a bit more. I'm going out places, seeing other people because I can pretty much sometimes lock myself. You know, I'm not, like I'm telling you earlier, I'm not, I'm telling all these people do these things and I'm not perfect myself. So. And like you said earlier, the hard, that one of the hardest things to do is to get off that sofa. But once you do get off that sofa, boom. But anyway, that's what that's what it did for me. It made me. Um, it did make me a better person. I do believe. That's great. So, what can we expect from Matt in the near future? I'm, I'm <laughs> two years away from my fiftieth birthday. birthday. Um, um, so I'm, so I'm planning, plan, I've, I've got an idea, idea to do uh, uh, some kind of crazy Lord George, 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 George Challenge. challenge. It'll, be it'll, be first, it'll be the first, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be a world first, world first, first done it before. before. So I'm going to so try, try and work, work on, on that. that. Um, um, do some do more, do some do more cooking, cooking, write another, write another book, restart my YouTube channel again, and just... Get my, yeah, my I've got, got, got a tattoo shop, shop, shop uh, in, in Cardiff. So, so there's a few things going on with that at the moment. We're going to be, be um, doing re and doing a lot of new stuff. stuff for that. So, so there's plenty, 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 on, plenty the on the cards. On the cards. And, and, um, and um, just for this cross, we're going to go into the lockdown. I mean, you're all going to stay in and still just carry on, keep it fit, enjoy life, hanging out with my dog, hanging out with my fiance, getting married, moving to Spain. That's 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 what I'd like to do. That sounds like a great plan. All of that busy stuff that's going to keep you busy forever, I think. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you today. Thank you very much. Brilliant, no worries. Thank you very much.